Right now on Who's Your News Source, we hear from students how they feel about mask mandates coming to an end. And we welcome a special guest to learn what the conflict in Ukraine means for us in the U.S. And I have an outlook on March precipitation as well as a look at Friday's winter storm. Who's Your News Source starts now. Hello and welcome to Who's Your News Source. I'm Emma Herway. After almost two years, IU lifted its mask mandate for on-campus buildings last Friday. Some students are still choosing to keep their masks on, and some teachers are asking classes to stay masked up. HNS reporter Elizabeth DeSantis talked to students about how they feel about the mandate ending. I'm sure you're aware that today, March 4th, um, masks were lifted across campus and became optional. So what are your feelings about that? Do you feel safe? Uh, I don't feel safe at times within classrooms and like enclosed rooms, but outside I feel pretty safe, I guess, because I'm now used to people not having masks and I'm, like, I'm not wearing a mask outside right now. Today, the new policy went into effect March 4th where you no longer have to wear yeah. a mask. How are you guys feeling about that? Are you feeling safe? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling great. I, it's been so annoying to wear it and it, I'm finally ready to just take it off and it feels great to show my face, you know? Yeah, I just want to make sure when I if when I take off my mask, I want to make sure the people around me feel comfortable with it. Yeah, definitely. I personally feel fine, but I want to like respect other people's feelings, right? Yeah, I feel like that's the most important thing. You've had your entire collegiate career here yeah. be with masks on, so how does it feel now that they're finally coming off? Um, I'm a little worried, especially like with spring break coming up, and I know not everyone's going to be fully responsible, yeah. so. I know I'm going to keep wearing my mask probably at least a little bit till after spring break is done and then see how things go. Were there many students in your classes today going maskless or did most of them make the decision to kind of keep the mask up? Uh, most people were maskless, yeah. And have you guys had any t-shirts that have maybe asked students to keep their masks on or? Yeah, my one of my science teachers, Miss Andrews, she's she doesn't really want like she's not very comfortable with it, so she makes us wear the masks, but my other teachers are fine with it. Those who do not want to stop wearing masks just yet are encouraged to participate in one-way masking and continue to wear masks indoors on campus. H&S reporter Elizabeth DeSantis joins us now in studio with a special guest from the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies to discuss Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Elizabeth? Thanks, Emma. Joining me now is Professor Dina Speckler. Dr. Speckler is an IU professor and author with a PhD from Harvard University, who specializes in Russian foreign policy, among other things. Welcome to Ho Who's Your News Source. We're so glad Thank to have you. you here tonight. Glad to be here. Thank you. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, uh, it's a bit rushed, but uh, Matt got over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, for many of our viewers, the situation in Ukraine seems very far away. How do you think it's, we're going to start seeing it affect us here in the U.S. and in Indiana? The most immediate effect is going to be prices of gas at, at the pump. We're already seeing that. And now that President Biden has said that we will be importing no further oil from Russia until they have halted their invasion, uh, I don't even know how long that's going to last. And Meanwhile, there will be shortages. So the president is scurrying around, uh, even um, trying to get from previous uh, folks that he, he wanted to isolate on the international stage, like Venezuela. He's trying to get them to step up and uh, supply more gas to the United States. But uh, in the meantime, consumers here are going to feel that very directly. I know you've already mentioned the um, ban that um, Biden announced today on Russian oil. Do you think that some of these sanctions that we and other countries have put in place will be enough of a deterrent to Putin? No, at least it will take an awfully long time for that to happen. Uh, President Putin is, has very definite objectives that are very important to him. He's ready to bear the pain. Uh, I think with time, possibly some of the sanctions uh, and uh, really what America does alone is less important than what the EU or our European allies do together with us. So one of the reasons why sanctions are not biting as hard as they could is the Europeans who are very dependent on imported oil and gas are very reluctant to sanction these, these items. But no, uh, it doesn't seem as though that's in the short run at any rate is going to have an effect on, on Putin's actions. Over the long term, if what's in store is a long occupation uh, or insurgency in Ukraine, at some point 
there may be enough pressure from inside Russia to say, um, to, to lead him to make compromises. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. And so I know last week Putin put his nuclear forces on alert. Yes. And if these sanctions aren't going to be enough of, de of a deterrent, do you think that, how, I mean, how seriously do you think we have to take the threat of nuclear war? I would take it very seriously. So I, I'm not suggesting that everybody run for shelters uh, or come up with an emergency plan tonight. But um, we have to be very careful, and we are being very careful. We ourselves are putting all kinds of constraints on what we are ready to do to help Ukraine so as not to provoke Russia into uh, using nuclear weapons. But, but it could. And Russia's military doctrine is that if it is not prevailing uh, in a conventional conflict, it will escalate. Uh, and, and will employ nuclear weapons. Um, I don't think the first ones to be employed would be directed at American territory, but again, uh, you have to take it seriously. You can't ignore that. No, of course. And I know this week we've seen thousands and thousands of Russians be arrested for protesting. Yes. So do you think this is indicative of maybe that the Russian people aren't behind what Putin is doing? What do you think is the national attitude right now on that? So that's a little hard to know because the government is not allowing completely independent polling here. But most reports out of Russia say that while there is a, a very vocal and courageous minority of people who uh, oppose the war, one thing that is hard for Americans to grasp is that if you're living in Russia right now, unless you are in the habit of trying to uh, access such things as the uh, Telegram app for your news, if, if otherwise, if you're relying on the Russian news media or Russian television, you hardly know there's a war going on. Uh, people who live in Ukraine who have relatives and friends in Russia uh, are talking to them, reporting what's going on, and, and they're saying, war? What war? Uh, so this is a so-called limited military operation, according to Putin. It's not one that appears daily on the television screens. If it does, what they're showing is a, a very, very limited operation with nobody shooting anything, just troops moving in very peacefully, unresisted. Um, so convoys moving slowly along. But we get a steady diet, uh, the major national newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the front page is covered every day. It's been that way since um, February 24th. Every single day, uh, vast amounts mm -hmm. of coverage and uh, the you know, electronic media as well. It's not the case in, in Russia. Uh, and then insofar as they pay attention, the version that they're getting is that this is uh, an, a limited occupation to eliminate Nazi gangsters who have uh, taken over the presidency and to liberate Ukrainians from uh, a, an oppressive regime that uh, is threatening their own freedom uh, and is, uh, uh, as I say, governed by fascists or controlled by fascists. So, you know, what's there to oppose if you're a Russian citizen, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the opposition, if it grows, will have more to do with uh, the impact of sanctions on people's pocketbook, on inflation in Russia, and the unavailability of imported goods, or even such mundane things. I gather, I was very sad to see that um, McDonald's, which along with Coke, were the two main businesses to open up in the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and it was really a great moment of celebration to see the arches uh, going up in some of Russia's major cities. McDonald's is now, and, and I'm, I'm sad not that it has pulled out, but that it, it has to, it feels the need that it pulled out. So Coke and McDonald's are, as of today, not operating in Russia. So we're really reverting to, uh, in that cultural sense, we're reverting to the Soviet days now. Uh, and Russians feel that. They like McDonald's and they like drinking Coke. Uh, yeah. So I saw that them, in addition to other um, companies like H&M, which has a very big presence um, in Russia and in Europe, um, will be pulling out as well. Do you think that um, the pains that Russia is going to feel economically may not come from the sanctions, but from these individual businesses pulling out? In part, yes, indeed. Uh, but the sanctions also are causing very substantial inflation in, in Russia and uh, the banks are not operating properly. People can't access their own accounts. 
So those two are, are going to hurt. Now, you know, the problem with sanctions is that they often don't turn people against an external opponent. On the contrary, they unite people behind the government, which portrays itself as under assault from uh, malicious external forces. That's also a possibility in, in Russia. So it's hard to predict. And I certainly wouldn't say now that the majority of Russians are up in arms against this, this war. They are not. So I will say all of this seems really bleak. The threat, the threat of nuclear war. Yeah. The, but I, I, we have had a lot of heartwarming stories coming out of yes, Poland and people yes. just pouring out their hearts and yes. giving aid to the um, refugees coming across their borders. So yes. what, do you, what do you think a future looks like for these Ukrainians fleeing for their lives and even just a future for the country? Um, those are two separate issues, <laughs> but they're related. But um, so a lot will depend on what these host countries are really able to do. And yes, uh, I too, maybe you have in mind the same image I did that in train stations uh, around Poland, uh, mothers who don't need all the baby equipment they have, particularly baby carriages, are just taking them to the stations and lining them up so that refugee mothers can you know, have a place to put their baby for a moment. Um, that, that was such a, a beautiful picture. Uh, and yes, people are lining up within uh, various transit points or border crossing points with signs offering transportation to various Polish cities. If you have relatives uh, uh, in Krakow or uh, Gdansk or wherever, uh, you, know, you can get a ride there and, and free. And again, that's volunteers doing that. But whether all this will be enough and, and the problems are formidable for finding lodging and employment, and, uh, it's a, a, the worst refugee crisis for sure since World War II. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Th thank you so much for coming in tonight. You're well, well said, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, um, Emma, we turn things back over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Members of the community came together last Friday to hold a candlelight vigil to show their support for Ukraine. HNS reporter Ashton Hackman was at the vigil and spoke to many who said the war feels personal. Under the chimes of the bells near sample gates and the fading sunlight, the community coming together in solidarity. We had a chance to express our anger and now I thought we needed a chance to come together and express our grief. People of all cultures holding candles, singing songs, and, and praying. I've never known a situation where I've read it and things didn't work out. You can see the dozens of vigil goers organized by the sample gates. This is the third event in less than a week. For many, this war hits close to home. Many people here born and raised in Ukraine. Some still have family members that are desperately trying to escape. We changed our sleep schedules to be awake when our families are awake, when our friends are awake. We've completely altered our lives and how we're living day to day. For as long as the war continues, the community will continue to show their support for Ukraine. For Hoosier News Source, I'm Ashton Hackman. Future events demonstrating the war in Ukraine will be announced by the IU Ukrainian Studies Organization. Coming up on Hoosier News Source after the break, we have this week's weather forecast as we head into spring break. And we learn more about students protesting over a climate action plan. Stay with us. Welcome back. Mia Keller now joins us with the week's weather forecast. Mia? Thanks, Emma. As we can see on the map, most of northwestern and eastern U.S. is projected to have more precipitation than usual this March, with the southernmost states being on the drier side. Indiana is anticipated to have the greatest chance of enduring a wetter than normal March, so be sure to have your umbrella and rain jacket ready to go. Now, let's take a look at Friday's winter storm. A powerful cold front will impact the region on Friday, bringing with it a chance for accumulating snow. Bloomington will likely see a mix of winter precipitation as surface temperatures will drop from the 50s into the 20s within a 12-hour period. The cold weather will stick around until Sunday, so remember to dress warmly. This blustery front will also affect regions to the south, bringing heavy rain and showers to those areas. 
Now let's take a look at the week ahead. Due to the winter storm, Friday and Saturday will be a bit of an anomaly, with temperatures dropping into the 20s as it comes through Bloomington. Thankfully, we have a respite from this cold weather heading into next week, with temperatures gradually warming up into the low 50s. We can also expect a slight chance of rain and some sunshine as we begin our spring break. Stay safe and warm and have an awesome spring break. Emma, back to you. Thanks, Mia. Students were vocal outside the sample gates on Friday as they protested the university for not having a climate action plan. President Whitten, will you listen? President Whitten, will you listen? The protest took place in front of IU President Pamela Whitten's office located in Bryan Hall. It was organized by Students for a New Green World, Sunrise Bloomington, and IU Student Government. Climate groups have been vocal all year holding protests to draw attention to the issue. The Indiana State Senate put an end to a controversial House bill which would have restricted discussion of controversial topics in the classroom. House Bill 1134 moved to the Senate for consideration after passing in the Indiana House on January 26. The bill attempted to limit teachers' ability to teach on controversial topics like race, religion, and sexual orientation. The bill would have also allowed for parents to have control over school curricula. Due to a lack of votes from Republicans, the bill did not pass in the Senate. HNS reporter Ashton Hackman now joins us in studio with the latest news from around the world. Ashton? Thanks, Emma. Russia has been accused of committing war crimes for firing on Ukrainian residential areas. Throughout the ongoing invasion, there have been several cases of possible violence against civilians, including children. Both the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson have made accusations against Russia. The International Criminal Court has opened an investigation. While the U.S. has refrained from confirming the claims, officials have stressed they will fully support the investigation. The national gas price has topped $4 a gallon for the first time in over a decade. It passed the milestone on Sunday when it rose 8 cents in one day. It is up 40 cents from the previous week as a result of the ongoing Russia invasion of Ukraine. Other factors could also be affecting prices, such as mask mandates lifting and more people traveling across the U.S. California has the most expensive prices, where the average gallon cost over $5. The lowest prices can be found in Missouri and Oklahoma, where a gallon is only $3.60. And with the escalating violence in Ukraine, Taiwanese officials voiced fears that they could be next. In an address about how Taiwan is helping Ukraine, Taiwanese Foreign Minister Joseph Wu said Beijing is watching the events to evaluate its strategy towards Taiwan. He fears that a weak response by the West might be a positive lesson for Chinese leaders. Some American officials are shifting their eyes towards Taiwan as well this week. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo called for the U.S. to formally and diplomatically recognize the Republic of China, Taiwan, as a, quote, free and sovereign country, end quote. That's all for what's going on around the world this week. Emma, back to you. Thanks, Ashton, and thank you for watching this week's episode of Who's Your News Source. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at IUSTV News. I'm Emma Herway from Bloomington, Indiana. We'll see you next time.